In this video, I'm going to answer a very good question I got in one of my previous videos and um, that is, if there is no good and bad, why do we say that people are inherently good? So stay tuned, let's jump into it. I welcome you with love and respects and the blessings of my Guru, His Divine Holiness, Bhagwan Shri Nityananda Paramashivam. So, in my previous video, um, which I made about God, I talked about various uh, cognitive shifts which have been happening in me since uh, I have been with Swamiji and I was sharing about the main differences in cognitions about who is Paramashiva, who is God and how does Paramashiva uh, operate and how does Paramashiva kind of, you know, manages or exists and how we can engage with him, how we can relate to him and how we can allow him to manifest through us. So I was giving a few uh, clicks I got about what Swamiji has been sharing with us and uh, my experience after living with Swamiji for, uh, since 2014. Now, uh, in the questions below that video, I got a bunch of good questions and one of them I want to pick up because I thought it was a very good question and um, it, there's a lot of things to say about so I thought that uh, answering it in a message would be waste so let's make a nice video about it and, uh, and share the cognitive shifts I've been having regarding this. So I'm going to read the question for you right now and then I'll uh, give you the clicks I got. So I have the question here. So the question says, Namaste, my respects. I do come from a, a strong Christian background in which this principle is taught. I understand what you're saying, except how does good and bad not exist in the flesh then? Why would we say people are inherently good if, it, if, if good and bad doesn't exist? During meditation, it makes sense to drop these cognitions, but back in the flesh, interrogation mark, are you saying that you're actually in a different physical reality through your consciousness and since there is no bad in your physical body, cannot be harmed by someone bad since that space doesn't exist in you? Question mark. Um, yes, and then a bunch of emojis. So. Yes, I wanted to expand on uh, yes the clarity and uh, every, yeah the cognitive shift I've been having since um, contemplating on what Swamiji is sharing with us on a regular basis through the satsangs, through the discourses. So the first thing is um, good and bad doesn't exist. So one thing I can uh, share rather quickly here before going into the main part of it is... Um, a good and bad is a perception. There's nothing good and bad uh, as in the objective uh, reality. It's just a subjective experience depending on the cognition you cherish. Um, for instance, if, you, if I go on a very gross level, uh, we can say, for instance, um, if you want to be healthy, eating fast food is bad. Eating fast food is not bad for somebody who perhaps is hungry. Because somebody who's, who's hungry, he just wants to feel, fulfill his hunger. If that's the only requirement, then fast food will fit what he wants. But if somebody is hungry and wants to have good health, then fast food is not good. So like that, good and bad varies uh, depending on the various cognitions you cherish. And ultimately, there's no good and bad. I'm actually going to put a quick extract now. Um, of Swamji uh, in the Akashic reading when he's in the space of Kalabedava and reveals and um, he basically shares that um, the pleasures and pains, goods and bads, both have to be experienced in the, in the body for you to realize that they are not um, real, real in the way that they do not last. It is just a temporary experience, it is not an eternal reality and therefore 
uh, that's not where we should infuse our seeking towards because there's no point of infusing seeking into something which is ephemeral, something which does not last. What we seek when we have intense seeking, sincere seeking, what we seek is to understand the reality of existence, the eternal, the eternity of existence and not the ephemeral experiences such as pleasures and pains, good and bad. So I'll just play the clip right now. The possibility for disillusionment and experiencing the other extremes is more easy in Bhuloga. In Bhuloga, you can extremely experience the pain and the opposite extreme of the pain, pleasure, very easily without difficulty. But in hell, you can never experience pleasure in heaven. You can never experience pain. When the opposite extremes are not experienced, the delusion continues to delude you. The disillusionment of anything happens only when the opposite extremes are experienced. When you experience the pleasure, disillusionment of pain happens. When you experience pain, disillusionment of pleasure happens. Both disillusionments finally giving you the realization both are illusion can happen easily only in human body in planet earth in Bhuloga because never pain happens in Swarga in heaven people do not perceive do not get disillusioned in heaven, they continue to remain, understand, think the pleasure is eternal. Because the disillusionment does not happen, they do not seek the ultimate reality. Same way in hell, because the disillusionment of the pain does not happen even by the moment of a pleasure, they continue to remain feeling the hell is eternal. That is the reason people who are in the hell or in the heaven feel it is eternal. Only in the Bhuloga, the truth of ephemeral reality, comparative reality is experienced. So anybody wants to experience the existential reality which is beyond ephemeral and comparative reality has to land on Bhuloga, and Bhuloga is the thinnest layer possible for penetration and going beyond your patterns, samskaras, and grams. So yes, in this clip we can clearly see that the purpose of experiencing these things is for us to experientially realize, to have the cognitive shift that pleasures and pains are not ultimate and that we should seek beyond pleasures and pains. Now, the second part of the question is, why do we say people are inherently good? Swamji also said that in a satsang, people are inherently good. Uh, that is an experience he got when he was living and being fed by people as he was traveling, doing his par parivrajaka around India. Uh, when you depend on others, you start to realize that people are inherently good. Now, I'm going to share the clicks I got regarding that. The truth which is revealed in the Vedas and which is truth. So whether you <laughs> click with it or not, it does not affect the fact that it is truth, is that we are pure consciousness and that pure consciousness is all powerful. So um, that is the truth. Whether you realize it or not, you are all powerful. Whether you're aware of your powerfulness or unaware of your powerfulness, that does not take away your powerfulness from you. It just, you will not relate with you in the same way if you are aware and if you're not aware. So when you're powerful, powerfulness, powerfulness, when I say powerfulness, um, what, I, what, what Swamiji made me clearly realize is that powerfulness is not like I said a little bit in a previous video, something we see in movies where, you know, you just, you come and you destroy the enemy and then you become victorious and this justice kind of mentality. That's not powerfulness. That's just kind of a entertainment industry uh, kind of cult ideas 
we get, uh, we, we absorb when we watch all these TV series and all these movies, but that's not powerfulness. Powerfulness, what Swamiji made me realize, it's a state where you are, um, when you're totally responsible for your life and you, and you, you see the reality as it is, and do not experience any forms of ups and downs because you're fully in tune with the reality. So there's no, nothing can affect you uh, because you are established in the highest space, the space of Paramashivoham. So when you're powerful, automatically you will be blissful, you'll manifest powers, you'll be serene, you'll be fulfilled. And when you all these and much more, and when you have all these things happening, when these things are happening in you, um, you do not feel like conquering anything, taking anything from anybody. You know, automatically you become selfless because you're fulfilled. When you're fulfilled, there's no such, there's no selfishness. Selfishness happens when there's a lack of fulfillment because we are unaware of our powerfulness and therefore do not know how to take responsibility for our lives and manifest what we want in our life. So, um, so powerful means fulfilled, fulfilled means non-violent, basically. When you're fulfilled, you're non-violent. And when you're non-violent, you all automatically do good to everything around you because there's nothing you need. You have realized what you are and you're just expressing that as long as you decide to retain the body. When you decide to drop the body, you drop the body. But like that, you become non-violent. But if we are unaware of our powerfulness because we do not have the right knowledge and there's various forms of ignorance and confusions which are cherished inside our inner space, we lose awareness of, um, of our powerfulness. And when we lose awareness of our powerfulness, we, automatically, we, we feel powerless. And when we feel powerless, we become violent. Now, there's different forms of violence. Some forms of violence are super subtle. Some forms of violence are super obvious. Uh, but violence is violence. And as long as powerfulness is not remembered, is not uh, realized, again, there will be some form of violence in our life. Now, the purpose of the spiritual path, the purpose of having a guru, the purpose of, of connecting with gods and goddesses is to become aware of our powerfulness again and to stop being violent and to re-establish ourselves in our original space of non-violence. So, yes, inherently we are good when we are aware of our powerfulness. But when you're not aware of your powerfulness, you need guidance. You need the right knowledge, the right experience for you to come back to your original state. Now, um, he says, when you during meditation, cognizing this is fine, but when you come back to the flesh, what does it mean? Now again, um, sometimes uh, we feel that spiritual truths are not practical, but actually they are. They are, but you have to constantly chew on them in order for you to realize how the truth of their existence in the objective world. Because even in the objective reality, the most superficial dimension of reality, even in that dimension, these truths are directly responsible for what you experience. But sometimes uh, you, you, we don't see it most of the time because when we engage with life at such a gross level, we become unaware. The, it is easier for us to, when you are in a, we, we, we all know, when you're in a comfortable environment, everything is silence, everything is supporting you, everything is going exactly as you would want the external world to relate to you, then you will be at ease. But if the external world is not responding to you in the way you want, then that's where you lose that space. And, and that's because of ignorance, because the very idea and the understanding we have about how world should be and all these things, there's various levels of confusion and lack of understanding and basically knowledge um, that makes us believe that uh, we should be afraid. And also one thing is, in the flesh, for what I realized, the cognitive shift I've been having uh, is that when we are in the flesh, we are strongly associated to our body. When you're too strongly associated to your body, 
Everything that threatens your body, you feel it threatens you. And when you feel threatened, you become violent. Actually, the, the very, the, the very, I, the fear of death. We see, when you're associated to the body, the body is not eternal. In some form, the body is not real. It has a certain purpose for a certain amount of time, but it is not an eternal reality. It is a temporary, that's why they say it's like a shell, right? It's like a vessel. It's like, it's like a, a vehicle you're using for a certain amount of time to go to, to, for a certain purpose. So if you're too attached to the body, everything that threatens the body, because the body is destructible, everything that threatens the body, you will feel it threatens you. When you feel threatened, then automatically you become violent. But the thing is that you are not the body. Body is part of you, temporary, because you have chosen to take one, temporarily it is part of you. But if at some point you lose this awareness, if you forget that body is, is part of you, and that you can continue to exist even without body, and you can just, if you're Hindu, you know that you can simply change body as much as you want. You can just decide to leave the body and take another body and continue whatever journey you're on in order to experience whatever you want to experience. And that's why uh, in, in that way Hindus are, Hindus are consciously very rich because you're not bound to one life, to this concept of one life. There is no such thing as one life. There's only eternity and you can uh, you are consciousness and if you wish to assume the body for a certain experience you can assume the body as many times as you want in order to fulfill whatever you seek to fulfill so um, that that's why you know you're consciously rich when you have this clarity when you have this cognitive shift so we are inherently good because we are all powerful that is also the truth that is that is hidden, the subtle truth which is, which is hidden behind all the gods and goddesses of Hinduism. Somebody who does not understand the space of consciousness um, and does not uh, understand the space of all-powerfulness cannot understand why so many gods and goddesses, they get confused. And that confusion happens because of lack of right knowledge, of complete knowledge. When you are all-powerful, you realize that everything is all-powerful that the source of everything is super-consciousness is Paramashiva and Paramashiva is all-powerful. But for us, we uh, in today's world, uh, one thing that I've clearly seen in my life is that we are, we strongly, we are... Because we're too associated to the body, the moment somebody is not tagging with you in the way you want them to tag with you, you feel, uh, you feel threatened. You feel threatened. You feel that, you know, you might be wrong. You might have some form of self-doubt, self-hatred, self-denial will be triggered. And from that space of self-doubt, self-hatred, self-denial, you will start to plan to discard the person from your life in a subtle way or in a, in a big way. You know, during wars, it's obvious. We are afraid of something. We just literally decide to discard their bodies from, from the planet Earth, which is the violence at its most gross level, the most obvious level, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, but there's various levels of violence. So that is why uh, we have to cognize this truth uh, constantly, and we have to look into and, and entangle with this truth, entangle with the source of this truth at the same time, which is Guru. That is why Guru, Guru means the dispeller of darkness aka the bestower of knowledge because darkness happens because you don't have complete knowledge so guru is the destroyer of dispeller of darkness which basically means the bestower of complete knowledge so whatever knowledge you impart from the guru you contemplate on that in you you cherish that in you all the time in every situation now in some situations you might you might not see you might not understand right away how this truth is applicable in that situation but if you if you're patient and you passionately contemplate on that truth sooner or later but the more intense you are the sooner you will realize um, how that truth is truth even in that situation where you feel um, it is not so just checking the question again so the last part of the question says 
are you saying that you're actually in a different physical reality through your consciousness and since there is no bad body um, cannot be harmed by somebody who has bad in their space so yeah what what i've been realizing and what swamiji is the embodiment of is that swamiji somebody was asking swamiji and they were saying swamiji if suffering is a reality is god suffering swamiji said suffering is not a reality and i am here to show you that because everybody around you is suffering does not mean suffering is a reality i came to show you that you can exist in a physical body without suffering to show you the space of possibility so um so like that so when you when you remember that you are pure consciousness when you establish yourself in the space of paramashivoham um the powerless the delusion of powerlessness is discarded from your inner space therefore you do not experience the reality in the same way a, a person who cherishes powerlessness does what you cherish affects your body if you're cherishing powerlessness it will affect your brain your nervous system your skin your hormones your chemistry everything will be affected by it in some way uh, and the same goes if you're powerful so you will the ramana marshi says actually he was at the end of his life uh he was suffering from cancer and somebody was asking him oh do you have suffering you're having cancer do you have suffering ramana marshi says he says there is pain but there is no suffering and uh, we have to really contemplate on what it means because suffering is creation from the mind pain is just a stimuli of the nervous system now how do we transform an intense stimuli of the nervous system pain into suffering that we have to become aware for ourselves and uh, to drop it and uh, and realize that no there is no need for creating suffering and that suffering is actually a self generated process now that does not mean that there is no pain but actually we do not know what pain is we only know what suffering is because we have associate we have created the link between pain and suffering is so strong that right away when there is pain automatically we create suffering so we feel it's like one and the same but it's not one and the same pain is one thing suffering is another thing uh like i said right it's like a stimuli i can see for myself as i've been living and practicing completion and 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 practicing swamji's um spiritual truths for the last few years now and definitely my body does not respond to life in the way that it used to even physically even if i if i if i if i hit myself i do even the pain and even the even my experience of pain has changed means that i i like i i don't know i i, I don't know how to say it's like the body does not experience pain in the same way so yes when you are established in a different space a state of consciousness the more closer you are from the space of paramashivoham the bad thing the things which are perceived as bad outside will not affect you actually paramashiva shiva is a known one of the great qualities of shiva is he is known to be able to transform anything useless into something useful so in the same way even if people throw different forms of powerlessness at you if they operate with your body with this body with a certain form of powerlessness when this powerlessness meets you you will not you will be able to tr- take that powerlessness and make it powerfulness because when you're powerful you know how to make anything powerful that's powerfulness right so there's no such thing as powerlessness coming into your inner space if powerlessness is coming to your inner space that means you're not in a powerful state when you're in a powerful state you will never allow any form of powerlessness to enter your, your it is not like you will not allow it's not possible because the moment any form of powerlessness enters your inner space automatically you will turn it into something powerful because that is the power of shiva that is the power of super consciousness that is the inherent pow- power which sits within every each one of us but it has to be we have to become aware of it it has to be awakened and for that uh, guru is there and that is why the guru disciple relationship is a very important relationship um and it leads to liberation liberation 
something I'm realizing is that liberation is just coming back to that space of pure powerfulness all the time, eternal powerfulness. So with that being said, if you have any, this is a, this is getting a very deep topic. So if you have any questions, again, drop them down below. I'll answer them. And if there's uh, other big questions like these, then we'll make more videos about them so that more and more people can be uh, enriched by these um, understandings. So inviting you again to subscribe, like, click the bell icon so you don't miss out on the videos. Um, write your questions below. Thanking you again for watching these videos. Share it with friends if you know some people who have these questions and are looking for some answers. Perhaps this could be uh, the knowledge and the, the, the cognitive shift they might be looking for. So uh, yes, so with this, I'll see you in the next video. Oh. Rudraya Maha, Rudraya Kala, Rudraya Kalpanda, Rudraya Veera, Rudraya Rudra, Rudraya Kora, Rudraya Kora, Rudraya Martanda, Rudraya Anda, Rudraya Pramanda, Rudraya Chanda, Rudraya Prachanda, Rudraya Tanda, Rudraya Shura, Rudraya Veera, Rudraya Bhava, Rudraya Bhima, Rudraya Atala, Rudraya Vitala, Rudraya Sutala, Rudraya Mahatala, Rudraya Sadala, Rudraya Thala Thala.